Okay, so kind of based upon the Quizlet and the previous things we've talked about, we've talked about the heal or the hydrogen atom. Now we're going to move on to the helium atom. So when it comes to the helium atom, we're going to again go through what does the Hamiltonian look like, what do those wave functions look like, and so on. It's going to start getting more mathematically complex as we move along. And we're going to have to make some approximations because we're going to run into an issue with the many-bodied effect where we have um, electrons that influence one another's position. But because they're dependent on one another, we can't separate them out with the current mathematics we have. The next big revolution will happen when we can deal with that many-body problem. And then you're going to see drastic changes happen in the sciences from that. So before we get there, though, we're going to drop back to our question, what does the Hamiltonian look like? Okay, we have our generic Hamiltonian. What is the Hamiltonian comprised of? Yep, kinetic and potential energy. Okay, now we got to think of all the different interactions of a helium atom. What is um, let's go with that one. Let's think about the subatomic particles in this system. How many protons? How many electrons? How many neutrons? Yeah. So this is a bit more complicated of a system. Now we got to think of all the different kinetic energy terms and potential energy terms that we have. Which ones do you want to tackle first? OK. So we're going to need some kinetic energy operators. What's the first one we're going to need? Or one that we could have? I wouldn't group them as a total of electrons. Yeah. So we'd have electron number one, electron number two, and yeah, their motions are coupled to one another, but really they each have their own kinetic energy, right? Then what else do we got? Yep. And luckily all those protons and neutrons are close enough to one another that we can say that's one entity. Okay, what else do we need? Yep, we're going to need some potential energies. What do we need? Yep. So we need the nucleus and electron number one. What else? Yep, same thing. Nucleus, electron number two. Any other things? Yep. And I was happy to see on the Quizlet everybody paid attention and knew that there was going to be some sort of interaction there. Okay. So we have to have an expression for each one of these. Let's try to break it down for each one of these things. Um, Can we reduce the number of terms down in any way? So last time with the hydrogen atom, what do we do with these kinetic energies? So we went from two terms down to one. Yeah. 
how did we do that? Yeah. So we're going to assume reduced mass. And which term is going to go away then? Or which operator? Got to keep the motion of these electrons, right? Yeah, the nucleus, it's going to get roped into these two. Okay. Kinetic energy operator, it's always negative one. Yep. Yep, two mu. And then what are we going to need there? Yeah. We need those second derivatives. We use the gradient symbol. And then we got to specify this is for electron number one. Then what should we do for electron number two? Yep, the exact same thing. Except we go electron number two. Okay, that's all the kinetic energy stuff. Potential energies, what are we going to need? Yep, we need the Coulombic potential for each, actually all of these in some cases. So uh, remember a generic potential term, you usually have some constants. And then you have Q1, Q2, all divided by the distance between the two, right? So what will it be for this first nuclear electron number one interaction. So we need the charge on the nucleus, which we're just going to call Z, right? What else do we need? Yep. Yep, and we're going to square it. Divided by, we got, what is it, 4 pi epsilon naught. Yep, and then what are we going to put there? R, but now we have two radiuses we have to worry about. We have the distance from the nucleus of electron number one and electron number two. How would you differentiate the two? What should we put here as a subscript? I'm just gonna put one for electron number one. Okay, what about this next term? Yep. Okay, the last term. What's that going to look like? Yep. We're going to leave it as e to the second. Because really, when we put nuclear charge here, we have coulombs, and it just makes it easier that way. And then what goes in the denominator? R3 would indicate a third electron. Yep, R12 for the distance between. OK. Tell me attractive or repulsive. This term. How do you know? Negative sign. This term. This term. The potential term. Yep. Next one. Attractive again. The final term. Yeah. Why does that make sense? So kinetic energy things are hard to rationalize, but this one, 
the interaction between the nucleus and the electron. Yep, opposite charges, opposite charges attract. So it should be energy lowering. What about this guy? Same charge, so what are they gonna do? Repel, and so that's gonna do what to the energy? Yep, it's gonna increase it. So when you're looking at this crazy mathematics, try to look at it and rationalize what's going on. You guys intuitively have a feeling for that. Um, but just look at these things and try to say, okay, what's actually going on here? Okay, this is all we need to solve for the Schrodinger equation. We gotta plug in some trial wave functions, but we have to use this Hamiltonian to solve our Schrodinger equation. Therefore, all we need to do Solve the Schrodinger equation. That's Hamiltonian. Okay, that would be a daunting task back in the day when they had to do things by paper and pen. Today we have computers to crunch this stuff. Great, it's awesome. What's the problem? There's a lot of things that are dependent on one another, right? What glaring thing makes this impossible to do of these terms? Yeah, so everywhere where you see an electron, electron number one is influenced by electron number two, and there's actually an other equations here. This is the really big problem. You can't get past that guy for certain. So all the problem comes from this thing. But yeah, these other portions we're, we're going to try to get around. So we've hit a wall. This is as good as we can get. But we want to go further. How would you go further with this? Well, in physics or like in analytical chem or even gen chem, what would you do when you hit a wall and you couldn't solve something? Yeah, we're going to make some assumptions. We have to make an assumption to continue on to get past this. So important point is impossible to solve with current mathematics. Mainly thanks to this guy, but yeah, there's other spots that they're connected. As we cannot separate. As our position of electron one and position of electron two depend on each other. What did you guys say we need to do to get past this? Yep, we're going to have to make an assumption. We're going to have to make an approximation. The approximation we're going to use is something called the orbital approximation. You guys have actually been doing this without knowing you've been doing it every time we've talked about atomic orbitals or molecular orbitals.
hard to imagine chemistry without orbitals, but there are actually theoretical frameworks that are called orbital free. Orbitals are just an idea. They don't actually exist, which is really tough to think that they don't exist because we've used them to explain everything we've seen in chemistry, right? Like, oh, homo interacts with lumo, that's what happens. They're a theoretical construct. They've never been measured. They actually mathematically cannot be measured because they have imaginary components in them. They're not real. <laughs> Great thing to tell you guys at the very end of your academic careers, right? Okay, but they're insanely helpful and they allow us to get past this problem. And we're gonna talk about them um, a little bit. So we're gonna try to justify using this orbital approximation and what, talk about what is the orbital approximation. And we'll show how that works. Are there any questions about this right now? Okay. Just because orbitals aren't real, that's, so I gave you an article um, by Johann Auschbach uh, about, or it's called titled Orbitals, Some Facts, Some Fiction, or something like that. And a lot of times we use language that is incorrect um, to talk about these things, but we all have a generic understanding of what's going on. So try to read through that and try to be a little bit safer with your language. It's overkill in some cases. I think it's really overkill. Um, but like in inorganic, if you were to be like, well, technically, Dr. Ogawa, that's not. You'd be like, yeah, you're right, but the language is useful. Or these really complex ideas, sometimes it's really difficult to express them. And like, if you have to add those little lawyer stars as a qualifier, something that was really easy to explain and concise can grow out of control very, very quickly. It's like conjugated bonds, as an example. Ah, shit, that's a bad example. <laughs> Actually, that's not a horrible example. That's a shitty benzene ring. We can draw another skeletal structure for this thing, though, right? Where should I put a, another double bond if I want to show this? Yeah, here, that guy's free, one there, and one there. Okay, we say that the bonds are alternating. Are they actually alternating? No, but a lot of times in organic chemistry, you show these bonds shuffling around to explain something that's happening. We all know that it's really just delocalization, but we talk about alternating bonds. We even use that word sometimes. That's not correct though, right? So, just be cognizant of your language. Know when it's not really true and when it is true. One of my professors said a, a good chemist knows when they can be sloppy. Keep that in mind when you're talking about things, okay? Or just even in the lab. So let's try and justify our, um, our orbital approximation. And we'll talk about what the orbital approximation is. upon this. Okay, so let's, let's summarize really quick any electron atoms. So the Schrodinger equation for a many atom 
or many electrons. It's difficult. And why is it difficult? Yeah, all the positions of the electrons depend on one another, they influence one another, it leads to a lot of problems. All of the electrons interact with one another. So they all interact and influence one another. These interactions can kind of be summed up into another term. There it goes by two different names. One you probably used for electron configurations to rationalize them. Does anybody know what these two terms are? You talked about exchange or electronic exchange. Maybe. Okay. We're going to go more in depth into it. And there's no classical analog to it. So. Do I have the correct number of electrons? No. Is that right? Five. Okay. I'm good. Okay. These are two separate systems. Which one should be lowest in energy? Yeah, it depends on the pairing energy, right? What things contribute to that pairing energy? Oh, yeah, the type, yes, the type of things you have interacting with it and so on, but even more generically, like that will change the orbital energy levels, but you also have an effect, the coulombic energy where they're getting pulled in. You have the correlation energy where all these electrons depend on one another. And you have the exchange energy. And what the exchange energy says is, is the more you can tell these particles apart, the higher the energetic penalty. So here, these two guys behave different than these three, right? Or at least you could distinguish them apart a little bit more. In this case, we can really tell these particles apart from one another, right? There's one that isn't paired up. There are two that are paired this way. So this one has a higher exchange energy in comparison to this system. We'll come up with a more formal definition of what exchange energy is, and we'll see it. We'll have to talk about matrices and determinants in a bit, though. So we have electronic exchange that has to deal with anti-symmetric properties of the wave function, being able to tell the particles about. And then the correlation or electronic correlation is the impact of one electron on all the others. Therefore, if we want to solve anything, we have to make approximations. We're forced to make approximations.
What's the one we said we were going to make for the helium atom? Yep. The orbital approximation. We're, we can apply it to any, any system, and it will still work out, but we're going to apply it to helium first. So any many electron system, you can do this for. So the wave function a many electron system is complicated. If we talk about a many electron system, what are what will our dependent variables be? If you think back to our Hamiltonian for the helium system, how many different variables did we actually have? What were they? Yep, R theta and the phi, but we have multiple R's. R1, R2, and these are the positions of the electrons, right? The nuclei can be roped in there, but we're just going to leave it as the electronic stuff for right now. And what, what are these R's again? Yep. It's technically a vector between the electron and the nucleus. Okay. Why is it difficult to solve the Schrodinger equation for a many electron system? Right. Yeah, it becomes a pain. And what things are interacting with one another in a many electron system? Yeah. So what approximation could you make to make this simpler? Whether it be right or wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we could group them. That's even more difficult than I want to do. Where's the hard part here? The electrons interact with one another, right? Yeah. Let's assume they don't see each other. We live in the land of make-believe right now anyways. Let's say, hey, they don't see each other. And that's what the orbital approximation is. Each electron occupies its own orbital, and the orbitals are independent. And, and are independent. Is that a good approximation? It's not, but it allows things to get solved, so maybe it's okay. The other thing is, is how many times, how many chemistry classes, like beyond general chemistry, 
have you used the word orbital? <laughs> yeah. So it can't be that bad if we're, if we're talking about it all the time. It does seem a bit ridiculous. There are ways we get around it, and that's like those other theoretical methods we talked about in lab, like density functional theory and so on. We, all, we use orbitals in a lot of those things, but then we, we conglomerate this non-realistic behavior in with other stuff, like the exchange correlation functional. Um, when we go to other systems, like many perturbation theory can, can rope some of this in. But for now, let's just focus on our system. Okay, so therefore, if we have a many electron system, dot, 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 what we're going to do is, is we're going to say that each thing, each electron occupies its own orbital, right? And they're independent of one another. How could we transform this function into something else with that orbital approximation? So mathematically, how is our new, what's our new function? Well, we can say we have a brand new function. And what does this function depend on? Yep, that one depends on R1. Then we can multiply it by another function that depends only on what? R2. And then we can have another function that depends only on what? Up, and so on. These fees, beta phi. Yeah. Each of these guys are the different orbitals that we're looking at. Okay. We know that this is not true. Because what happens in actuality? Yeah. Electrons actually interact with one another, so we know this isn't true. OK. Let's try to justify this for helium. Okay, to do that, orbital approximation, what does it mean again? Yeah, they're all independent of one another. So therefore, we'd have our wave function. What does our wave function initially depend on? R1, two, yep. How could we express that with the orbital approximation? Yep. Another spot we're going to have to look at is the Hamiltonian.
What we're going to do with our Hamiltonian is try to break it apart into contributions of H1 and H2. So we have a contribution of our Hamiltonian that only depends on H1, contribution of H2, but then we still have that potential that depends on um, both 1 and 2. Okay, H1, let's look at that one. Do we want to rewrite the total Hamiltonian out again that we did a little bit ago? I think it might be worthwhile. Okay, you have this in your notes already, but I think we just want to, I just want to scramble it down. Uh, what do I need next? Nuclei. Yeah. 4 pi, epsilon naught, R1, R2, and then plus like that. Actually, I'm going to leave that part. So H1, we're trying to split our Hamiltonian apart into independent contributions. H for electron number one. Which terms only depend on electron number one? Yep, so this belongs to H1 hat. Which one does this one belong to? This one. This next one. The third one. It belongs to both of them. Can we split them out? We're going to leave it like that. So H1 is really the kinetic energy of electron number one. And what else? What's that third term? A potential or a kinetic? Yep. And what's it the potential of? Yep, between nucleus and electron number one. H2, what do we got there? Yep, oops, half. And then the nucleus electron number two interaction. Now, V12, what does it actually depend on? Depends on the position of both electrons, but we've made the orbital approximation, which says what? They don't interact. So what could this be approximated to be? Okay, 
So when we do that with the orbital approximation, what we're going to do next is, is we're going to plug this into a generic Schrodinger equation, and we're going to see what happens. Am I okay to erase this bit here? Okay. So let's start with the generic Schrodinger equation. H hat. What else do we have? Psi. Uh, which depends on what for helium? Yep. Is equal to what? Yep. Okay, our Hamiltonian, we could break our Hamiltonian apart into what? Yep, H1 plus H2, right? And then what can we do with our wave function? Yep, we're gonna break our wave function up into orbitals. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is, is we're gonna multiply this across. Get H hat one, R one, R two plus H hat, and we're writing it this way because which way do operators act? Yep, to the right. Okay. That Hamiltonian. Which of these functions will it act on? Yep. What will it do with the other one? Mathematically. Does it do anything to it? Yeah, it's just a scalar. It doesn't do anything. So this guy gets left alone. What about for H2? Yep, it acts on that one. And what does it do with the one that depends on R1? Nothing. Leaves it alone. So we could rewrite this. It's going to pull out this guy. And what else are we going to get? So which of these is it going to act on? R1. Given we know how Schrodinger equations work and Hamiltonians work, what are we going to get out? Yep, and what's our constant going to be? Yep, E of what? Yep, times what else? Yep. Okay, what about the second term? What are we going to get out there? What can we pull out front? Yep, orbital of R1. After we evaluate the Hamiltonian, what are we going to get out? Yep, E2. Yep. Okay, what could we pull out of this thing? Or how could we simplify this? Yep. We're going to group those energies together. Okay. And now, what can we do with that?
we can change these back to what? Yep, you can change it back to the wave function. And this thing, this is the total energy, right? So these bits here, we're just going to change back to that. And then that portion is our energy total. So we've done a proof here to show, hey, whoops, if we take the orbital approximation, we can separate these two apart from one another, and we can solve it for, for a Schrodinger equation. We can get an energy out associated with electron number one and electron number two, and we can group them back up. Cool, so we've shown it's separable. However, What's wrong with this? Or what approximation did we have to make? Yeah, that the electrons don't interact with one another. However, in reality, oh, that sucked. That portion, what is not true about it? No, it's not equal to zero. And this is only an approximation. But it's useful for our purposes to solve some things. And we'll find out we can have workarounds or other theoretical methodologies that make it so we can incorporate fudge factors or we don't necessarily have to operate outside of this. Next time, what we're going to do is, is we're going to utilize the orbital approximation again and we're going to move to systems, helium included, but many electron systems. In order to do this, we have to review determinants. So if you haven't seen a determinant in a while, look it up. We'll do some math associated with it. It'll be kind of fun. But then we're going to apply um, the Pauli exclusion principle and try to come up with a way to express these really complicated wave functions in a different form. Now, the mathematics that we cover, the people who developed quantum mechanics actually had to develop that. They didn't know it. So you know more than the founders of quantum mechanics currently like, did at their ages and time. So feel good about yourself that way. Okay? Are there any questions at all? Okay. It's going to feel a lot like Sudoku puzzles in the next like week or so, so it tends to be a little more fun. Or I think it's fun. Um, but try not to lose sight of what we're doing and the approximations we make, okay? If you want to come in to do lab stuff anytime this week,